The case started in Worcester County, Maryland in the fall of 1931. At that time, the Green Davis family owned a small farm. Mr. Davis had a fruit stand where he sold the farm's produce on the well-traveled road between Berlin and Ocean City. It was on Monday morning, October the 11th, when neighbors discovered the stand was still closed and realized the Green Davis family was missing and went to investigate. What they found would change the eastern shore of Maryland forever. Two of the neighbors went to the home uh, where they discovered to their horror the bodies of Green Davis, his wife Ivy, and his two daughters, Elizabeth and Mary Lee. Uh, Elizabeth was 15, Mary Lee was 13, and all of them had been murdered in their beds. So that started the investigation, uh, which led toward the arrest of the person who everyone at that time knew as Orphan Jones. Later it was found that his real name was Yule Lee. The combination of the suspected murder weapon being found on the Green Davis family property and a search of Yule Lee's room uncovered missing items from the family immediately pointed suspicion onto Yule Lee of Snow Hill and he was brought to the Snow Hill jail. There he was repeatedly struck over the face with a blackjack and tortured. In his coerced confession, he admitted to killing the family over a wage dispute. He was hit by a blackjack on the way to Snow Hill by a deputy sheriff, uh, Deputy Hall, and he was beaten um, at the jail. The presumption of innocence needs to apply. Um, the fact that it, it often didn't in these cases is just another example of, of, of the culture that surrounds lynchings. Unknown to Lee, at the same time, the International Labor Defense League was making efforts to send him a lawyer as part of their anti-lynching coalition. The person they chose was Bernard Ades, a young, eager lawyer with ties to the Communist Party. He tried to see his client on October the 14th, but was denied by Warden Henry C. Martin under the direction of Joffrey Child and the support of Judge Franklin, who cited the attorney's involvement in the Communist Party. It really kind of struck a raw nerve with most Americans because they didn't understand it, and they didn't quite, they, they felt that it really attacked their um, morals, but it also attacked their democracy too. But yeah, I think that would have been synonymous anywhere you went, uh, especially with communism or anarchism or anything, any of those isms that, you know, people were kind of like, not really quite sure what it is, but I don't like it because, you know, if I don't understand it, it's going to scare me. But for his first hearing with his state-appointed attorney, Franklin Upshur, who publicly announces his reluctance in being involved in the case. Lee now formally faces four indictments for the murder of the Green Davis family. That same day, Ades is finally successful in interviewing Yule Lee, and shortly thereafter, Lee officially signs a retainer to have Ades as his primary attorney. As he had put it originally, the devil and the whiskey made me do it when he went to get revenge on Green Davis, who had cheated him out of a dollar. His second confession to Itzel was different in that he said, I gave him, uh, I think it was a hundred dollars of my money to hold for me and put in the bank. And he, when he went back, according to his second confession, when he bent, went back to uh, get the money, uh, Green Davis had told him that he put it in the bank of Ocean City and the bank failed. Tuesday, November 3rd, key witness and landlady of Yule Lee, Martha Miller, is taken from the eastern shore to Baltimore by Helen Mays, an IDIL member, in an attempt to have her change her testimony. She remains firm in her statement and is brought back to the eastern shore. Martha Miller, who owned the rooming house, was African American. And Martha Miller was a substantial and important witness in the state's case because she said that she had actually seen uh, Orphan, as she called him, coming and going with a satchel, with items in the satchel, and that the police had not planted any evidence there. 
Wednesday, November 4th, Aides is present in the Snow Hill Courthouse for a hearing about the removal of the case from the shore. His involvement in the case infuriates members of the local community and violence ensues. That incident in Snow Hill results in the case and Lee being moved to Cambridge for his safety. When he tried to get to his car, the mob surrounded him and his two companions, Oscar, Oscar Rabowski and uh, Helen Mays. And the judge, uh, Judge Bailey, and the sheriff literally had to rescue them from the mob. They locked them up in the jail, which was behind the courthouse, for their own safety. Outrage over his removal would soon lead to a similar and far more severe reaction, the lynching of one Matthew Williams. Official story goes that there was an argument over, over, over Matthew Williams' wages and that he shot Daniel Elliott, his boss, and then proceeded to shoot himself. Or that uh, Daniel Elliott's son, James Elliott, shot both shot shot um, Matthew Williams as he tried to escape. They kidnapped him from the uh, Peninsula General, which is now PRMC. They his head was bandaged because he had a head wound from from a gunshot, whether that was self-inflicted or by James Elliott. Um, he so he couldn't see where he was going. So imagine like you know being abducted from a hospital bed, thrown out the window, dragged down the street, beaten, cursed and not be able to see. And, and plus, they had him in a, I think they had him in a straitjacket because they, and I, I know, they assumed he was mad or something. Um, so he, could, he was no way he could fight back. There was a boxing match going on at the same exact time this was going on, and the boxing hall cleared out in order to, um, in order to, to really um, get an idea and to get a sense of like what was going on out in the, the courthouse lawn. They took him uh, to the courthouse. They... I think they might have drugged his body, but, but, but the point is, like, they, he, he was forcibly taken. Uh, I think someone tried to stab him with an ice pick. Um, he was hung multiple times up and down. Uh, at some point, he, like, you know, he did actually pass. They actually did kill him. Um, there were hundreds of people in the crowd, they, and they actually, there were some black workers at the Wicomico Hotel, which is just right across from the courthouse right now. Um, that they forced to go out there and watch. The Orphan Jones case really did amplify the Matthew Williams, Williams lynching and then the subsequent lynching in Princess Anne with George Armwood. I think the violence that's, uh, that surrounded both of those cases too was a direct, uh, were direct descendants of what happened with Yuli. I think the Yuli case, not only with legal precedent uh, with Bernard Aids, but also with uh, the heightened veracity, I think, I think really kind of set the stage for Williams and then for Armwood later. The lynchings are particularly disturbing, obviously, because of the, 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 the horrific outcome. But even more so horrific is the sentiment that allows these sorts of things to occur. When dealing with issues of racism and white supremacy, you the fact that that enough white people on the shore felt that they were denied the chance to exact mob justice on Yu Lee made it made it more likely that someone like Matthew Williams was going to get lynched if something did happen and in that case that's exactly what happened. Typically especially in this case you have a that you have a, a, a black man accused of a, of a heinous crime against the white family and you have a very very charged racially charged and also I mean you're talking about first degree murder here um, and the accusations run pretty deep you have a, a community that will rally around the the uh, the victims and to make sure that there's justice taken there's justice carried out and if there if it's their own version of justice then that's the way it's going to be but overall throughout the throughout much of the south and here on the eastern shore you did have a, a, an essence of Jim Crow um, well, not really even just an essence you had a, you had Jim Jim Crow laws had a strong hold or the the era of Jim Crow had a strong hold over eastern shore and. I can hardly imagine, uh, you know, that maybe if my father had a shotgun, maybe some other person had a rifle, somebody else had pistols. But can you imagine 14 or 15 people walking all out in the woods with all those different weapons? I would think it would have been a pretty dangerous place to be. If you weren't part of the solution to this problem, then you were part of the problem itself. So a lot of it had to do with uh, the psychological aspect. 
that if you're not part of this, then you're not supporting your community or you're not supporting those that are, are, are the victims in the, in the actual crime. The unimaginable brutality and miscarriage of justice led to criticism of the Eastern Shore's practices by citizens of the Western Shore. The biggest kind of call out that I ever saw was the, um, the way the Western Shore newspapers reacted to the Matthew Williams case and to, and to even Yule Lee's case. The Baltimore Sun was a large um, newspaper of considerable uh, influence in Maryland at the time. And one of the writers and editors of the Baltimore Sun was H.L. Mencken. And Mencken hated the Eastern Shore. He always did. Uh, he advocated that the Eastern Shore secede from Maryland and uh, was famously quoted as having said that it is a tragedy that the vote of one malarial peasant on the Lower Eastern Shore is equal to that of 10 Baltimoreans. The Baltimore newspapers and some of the Baltimore organizations really started tapping into um, kind of the, the moral code, like what does it really mean to be you know, a, a Maryland. Aides used Williams' death to argue having the case completely removed from the Eastern Shore. This too was met by further protests by local residents. However, following hearings with the Court of Appeals, the case was officially and finally moved to Taos in Maryland. You have people that in this in the more metropolitan and more liberal areas kind of calling for racial justice and then you have the people on the western shore and the eastern shore really calling for mob justice we know how to handle our own there's a lot of bad sentiment on the shore that that justice and i put that in quotation marks was denied the white mob on january 20th 1932 the state of maryland versus Ewell lee begins after a short two-day trial lee is found guilty a motion for a new trial is submitted by 80s and denied by judge t scott oftet who sentences Lee to death by hanging. It is uh, justified that he was convicted. Even H.L. Mencken uh, admitted that uh, his guilt was proven beyond a reasonable doubt. His cause was totally um, damned from start to finish. Um, I really don't think that, if you're talking about a fair trial, I don't think that he would have been able to get that here. Um, and I mean, which also begs the question, did he actually really get a fair trial to begin with, with all the pomp and circumstance that kind of surrounded it? On February 19th, Bernard Aids wins an appeal citing judicial prejudice as African Americans are excluded from the jury. This sort of racism uh, occurs when people are afraid of the other, as Edward Said would, would, would reference, people of color. And, and when that fear needs an outlet and needs a way to be expressed, then laws were put in place. It, a lot of the things that he did as far as making sure that African-American jurors were on the, uh, the, the, the jury, um, that uh, you could request for a, a trial to be tried elsewhere, you know, in the state or something along those lines. His, his approaches to defending Yuli uh, were set the precedent for many, many civil rights cases all throughout you know, the, the, the next 30 years. This leads to the second trial where Lee is found guilty once again, and the verdict is upheld by the Maryland Court of Appeals and the United States Supreme Court. The death warrant is signed on May the 11th. Ewell Lee is set to be executed on June 2nd, 1933. Uh, he was tried twice in Baltimore County when the Court of Appeals reversed the case, of course, because there were no African Americans. Uh, they had five that were chosen on the jury potential panel. Uh, unfortunately for the defense, the state has more what they call preemptory challenges than just five. So they struck all, and preemptory challenges are challenges that are given for no reason at all now. Uh, it is clear that the Supreme Court has now said in the 21st century um, that uh, you cannot exclude someone in a peremptory challenge just uh, because of race. However, that law did not exist in 1932. Uh, so the Baltimore County uh, State's Attorney, who was assisting Godfrey Child, the Worcester County State's Attorney, in prosecuting the second case, 
simply struck all the African Americans. So the second time around, likewise, he was convicted by an all-white jury. Back on the shore, racial violence continues as another African American, George Armwood, is lynched in front of the Somerset County Courthouse. Aides uses this case to seek clemency for Lee from both Maryland Governor Albert Ritchie and President Herbert Hoover. Those efforts fail, and Lee's execution is scheduled for October 27th. We felt that there were the, the, those that were being uh, subjugated, and they were the ones kind of seen as, seen as the, the saviors of the subjugated, and that kind of translated from not just workers and laborers being crushed by the, the capitalist society, but it also had to do with African Americans who kind of found their, who, who also found a niche uh, within kind of like hitting their feelings a little bit with that. We're entertaining and, and trying to lure blacks in just to raise their numbers of, of, of membership here in the United States. They were just bodies to fill spaces. Six days before his execution, a large demonstration is held and supportively by the Communist Party in an attempt to save his life. In spite of popular support, Aides is suspended from practicing law and faces disbarment proceedings. The disbarment in Maryland was politically motivated. Uh, the, the Baltimore uh, bar uh, just had had it with him. He also faced disbarment proceeding in the federal courts uh, because what he was trying to do, and, and giving him credit, he and Levinson were trying everything they could to prevent the execution of Yule Lee, even to the extent of going to the White House to try and get uh, a commutation. Yule Lee signs over his body to Bernard Aides before his execution and is hung hours later. Aides attempt to obtain Lee's body for a national viewing of what he called a legal lynching only further damages his disbarment case and his subsequent career. Yule Lee was buried in an unmarked grave protected by law enforcement in fear of the body being removed. After Orphan Jones was executed, Bernard Adis produced a will whereby Orphan Jones willed his dead body to his lawyer. Now, Adis said to the uh, warden of the um, Baltimore City Jail, uh, Brady, uh, that he wanted the body. And Brady said, you're not getting the body because the law says that if no family member shows up, the body is buried at the expense of the state of Maryland. So he just actually filed suit to get the dead body of Orphan Jones. Uh, the case was heard on a Saturday, amazingly enough, uh, by Judge Eugene O'Dunn in Baltimore City, and O'Dunn was outraged by the uh, perception that this man, because he found out that Adis had drafted the will, he was outraged by the fact that he would uh, do this to his uh, uneducated Following the case, Aides faced public reprimand for his involvement and for his actions throughout the proceedings. Raising further controversy, he was represented by Thurgood Marshall and Charles Houston, two well-known African-American lawyers from the NAACP. He was suspended and eventually reinstated, but would never advance again as an attorney. I think the significance was more kind of spitting in the in the face of the, the establishment. Um, but, I mean, both, um, I mean, Thurgood Marshall was an extremely talented lawyer. And um, he, what I would think of, what, you know, my, my, my thought process is that Bernard Ames knew, knew, knew exactly what he was doing um, and really, um, kind of not only saying that it was a political lynching, but also attacking his communist beliefs, but also um, attacking the fact that he himself was trying to defend, you know, a, a poor black man in Worcester County on the Eastern Shore. Almost a century later, the impact of this case can still be felt on the quiet and still mainly rural Eastern Shore. A reflection on the Eastern Shore's involvement in the most depraved part of the United States history allows us to recognize the lowest points and greatest strides in our community. The live feed has really, it puts people on notice. And you have to, if you have, if you have some of these beliefs, you better 
I mean, whether you have these beliefs or not, you, you, you're you always in the spotlight no matter what. The point is, you start at any one point on this historical timeline, you realize that they're connected to every other point on the timeline. You can't talk about lynchings without talking about slavery. And you can't talk about lynchings without talking about modern day police brutality. Um, whereas some of these lynching mobs, uh, some of these lynching uh, mobs and some of these lynching events, people, you see pictures of people you see pictures of people, you know, with the bodies and whatnot, sometimes with smiles on their faces. Those people are long gone. Their ancestors are around, but it's not necessarily something they want to talk about. Um, but like I said a little bit earlier, if you're not part of that solution, then you become part of that problem. Seeing that this, this is what a community can do to its own. If we can do that, doesn't it mean that everything else we can do as well? That it's not past, it is literally who we are as a country, as Americans.